Was that? Let me do this. <laughs> My brother Bante, I, I want you, I don't want to misspell your name, right. uh, mispronounce it. Um, so I want you to pronounce it for me and give me also your African name. Yes. My name is Bante Kabogoza <coughs> Budarakita. My African name is Kabogoza. And then the Buddhist name, as a Buddhist monk, I was given a name called Buddha Rakita. Wonderful. Um, are you, or were you, um, involved in traditional African religion before you became a Buddhist? I'm not so deeply involved in African religions, but I had an understanding, a genuine understanding of what African uh, spirituality in, in Rova. I've been uh, there before and I saw as a young person what they do in terms of initiation but I was never initiated so I have a genuine understanding of African spirituality and uh, during my studies I researched about it and then I had to make a presentation about African religions okay what I what the question I want to ask you mm. and you can be free to mm. answer anyway mm. Um, if you compare the two, what are the similarities and which came first? Uh, I, I want you to compare the two, but uh, to you know. To compare between African traditions? And yeah, and, and Buddhist, and which came first? Well, <coughs> it's very difficult to really uh, find out whether it's African tradition uh, or Buddhism which came first. From the deep tradition we found out that uh, most of the animist, uh, uh, animism... You, you calling them animus? Yes. Why do you call them animus, if I may ask you? Yeah, because that's really in general, really to revering uh, gods in stones and different, uh, different objects. So all these are considered to be the ancient religions. But Buddhism also claims to be very ancient religion or philosophy. It's very difficult to really find out which came first. Where it's like chicken and egg. It's very difficult really for me to determine which came first, whether African spiritual tradition or uh, Buddhism. But my heart won't believe though African tradition because that's where all the ancient civilization came from. So I would say African tradition came first before Buddhism. But in terms of similarities, there's actually a lot of similarities because Buddhism is talking about the truth. And then wherever there's a truth, Buddhism presents itself because the Buddha taught uh, the Dhamma, which means the truth. So I can see the way we deal with environment. Uh, environmental teaching of the Buddha is so similar to African tradition how we respect trees, how we respect nature. So in that respect, uh, there's a lot of similarities. And also, when you look at Buddhism, it's human-centered. It's not so much about God-centered. So it's actually uh, centered on human values. And I see a lot in Africa about uh, human values as the central teachings of uh, African tradition. For instance, I give you the concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu concept means you are because I am and I am because you are. So you can see uh, the relationship between people, how they are interconnected with Ubuntu concept. And in Buddhism, we have a similar concept which say when this is, that is. When this is not, that is not. When this rises, that arises. When this ceases, that ceases. So you can say again that's a, a core concept in African tradition similar to Buddhism. And in terms of uh, ethics, moral conduct is, is so similar. And uh, in terms of uh, practices like uh, virtues, generosity, compassion, loving kindness, all these are similar uh, in Buddhism and in the African tradition. But there's also, of course, some differences, especially the ultimate goal. In Buddhism, the ultimate goal is to attain final liberation, which is called Nirvana. It would be too much to ask African tradition about Nirvana. 
but yes, actually, um, there's a difference, but there are many more similarities and differences. I think. Okay. Mm. I just want to backtrack a bit and uh, the terminology animus. Uh, where does that come from? That's not African. No, it's not African. Unfortunately, uh, this is something that uh, other people uh, brought, in, or, or people who don't believe in the, uh, a religion, that Western religion or Eastern religion. So these people who are actually uh, respecting nature, they are call them. They call them this uh, animist. <laughs> but uh, this is not coming from Africa, actually. But why do you use that terminology? Do you know? how Africans related with the universe and with themselves and their oneness with the universe because they didn't use the terminology God either but they did uh, you know use the terminology creation yes yes well uh, the thing is uh, in, in, in the African tradition mm -hmm. uh, still there's a belief of a creator they may not call God in English but they have different names like for instance in Uganda we have the word Katonda mm -hmm. Katonda means to creator there's still some kind of belief of in supernatural power out there creating something but when it came to the different beliefs in Africa we believe there's a God for the lake Lake Naluba there's a big lake but they call Victoria now we call it Lake Naruval. There is a there's a god for uh, for for rain. There's god for fire, Kibuka. There is a rainbow god called Musoke. So different, different. The revered objects of nature, like uh, whether it's rain, whether it's fire, they had space, space, small gods with a small g, as opposed to a big g, you know, big one as a creator. So I think uh, African tradition, uh, they have uh, similarities to uh, what they brought, uh, like in terms of Christianity, they just absorbed it and say, here we have a bigger creator. So forget about all the small, small gods like this. No, I was just trying to get a better understanding because mm. the African worldview is that everything is everything. Yes, and yes. that there is one source of energy yes. which cannot be created, not destroyed. Right, right. But everything comes out of that source of energy, and we all are part of that. You are right. creation. I am creation. The right. water is creation. But right. it, it all is interrelated. Yes. So that as I breathe out, mm. the trees breathe in. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, so, but. Uh, you know the terminology, uh, animus, I mean, and yeah. all of that kind of nonsense. Right. Uh, it it devalues it the devalues. original right. spiritual concepts right. of people of the first people of the universe, out of which all human knowledge came through. I'm with you. On Even that. speech. So I mean, I'm just trying to right. get you to right. acknowledge. Yes, you're the right. Depth and that all other religions come mm. out of an African spiritual concept. And in fact, change. actually, that's why I say at the end, I say I believe that uh, all tradition came from Africa because of the first civilization. I had, I, I had a, a difficult time to really find the time frame of Buddhism in terms of uh, which is uh, when it started. But when you look at it, they think that it was there from the very beginning. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about Eon and Eon, there's so many Buddhas and all that. So basically, uh, when I look at really uh, science, uh, science, mm -hmm. they found out we all human beings came from Africa. Uh, in in, in uh, Karahari, they, they tested what to call the blood and they found mm -hmm. out uh, tracing from the genolo genetics, mm -hmm. the DNA, they found out we all came from a single mother and single father in Karihari Desert. This is already a documentary film uh, proven scientifically. So now with that background, that makes sense that all people, whether they're Indian, Buddha was from India, and when Buddha, uh, they say the Buddha is from India, but when you look at it from genealogy, geneal, ge genetics, all it came from Africa. So that's the most ancient tr tradition, or spiritual tradition. 
So mm. this naming of these terms, I think it was colonialism, and they start naming even the word Buddhism. It's not, for us, we don't know the, uh, the word Buddhism because ism and Buddha you cannot put together. So we know Dharma as the truth. So even animism is that there's an ism there, and animism. So I think it's derogatory. Derogatory, I think, uh, in, uh, for our spiritual tradition. I, I'm with you on that. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I acknowledge that. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you to define mm. soul for me. What is the soul? How how do you how do how do you um, hmm. I lost my chain of thought. <laughs> you, you can't get interrupted. You do well. I mean, you know? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. I was looking at oh, what no. you're looking at. Yeah, but me, I'm on, on track. I'm on track. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, asked me to Let's go back to, to the soul. Yeah, yeah, because now we're trying, I'm trying to understand how you perceive uh, humanity and its uh, mm. relationship in terms of its oneness with creation mm. uh, and, and the soul mm. and, and what is humanity made of what is man how do you conceptualize and departmentize uh, the body the soul the mind yeah from a buddhist point of view as a buddhist monk what we call a being is made of the five components or processes one is the body two is feelings three is perception four is mental formations and the fifth one is consciousness and uh, these are processes, they look like nouns, that, but these are verbs. And within those five uh, components, we call them the five aggregates, which are uh, subject to cleaning. Uh, we don't find anything which is permanent, which is called a soul. In other words, in Buddhism, we don't have what we call a soul. I, we find this soul theory in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. In the Buddhism, we find quite the opposite. So the Buddha, what, uh, uh, when he came to the scene, all people were believing in the soul as a physical thing you find in the body. Mm -hmm. And after death, it comes out and then it gets in, reincarnated in, and gets another body. But when the Buddha came, he said, no, no, no. In these five aggregates, the body, feelings, and so on, as I told you, he didn't find a single physical thing that is indestructible. You cannot find anything that is indestructible in these five processes. So in other words, as a Buddhist, we believe in uh, non-soul. In other words, selflessness. It's just a process. These are just processes. When you say processes, what do you mean? They're changing, like the body is changing all the time. Feelings are changing all the time. Since you came here, your body has changed. It's a process. It's mm -hmm. not physical as you look at it. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's physical, yes, but actually new cells have come and old one is gone. So mm -hmm. in other words, you cannot claim that this is the same body I came with. <laughs> By mm -hmm. the time you finish, new cell, you'll have new cells and, and the old cell will be gone. Feelings. Now your feelings, you came with the pleasant feeling, neutral feelings, unpleasant feelings. Mm -hmm. By the time you leave, you have different feelings, not mm -hmm. the same feelings. Perception. You've never seen a Ugandan monk. Now you've seen, you have seen a Ugandan monk. Where is your old perception? Where <laughs> you knew that, okay, there's a Ugandan monk looks old or young or whatever. So you have a, now a brand new perception. What about mental formations? Also, that's the fourth aggregate, which is a process. This is a bunch of uh, uh, mind states like mindfulness itself, loving kindness, compassion, and all these mind, mind states are uh, bunched together which into what we call mental formation are changing all the time. And now the fifth one is called consciousness. Consciousness, we can simplify it is the, in, the, in terms of the six senses, seeing. You're seeing me here now, Every time you're seeing is rising and passing away. Don't stay the same. Right? The hearing the same. Now you're hearing me talking. Once you hear one minute and then I continue uh, talking, then the first thing that you've had is rise, has risen and has passed away. Now you're with another word. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now it, what, that's what we call a processes. What we are, we human beings, what we call ourselves human beings, uh, to the Buddha, these are just processes. 
Okay. Yes, and without a single entity or something that is beyond destruction, which we call a soul. So I cannot define a soul for you because in Buddhism we don't have the word soul. Okay. We can't find one. It's okay. Hinduism that have this word soul theory. Okay. Mm. So what happens? Um, define. Talk about death, life, and death, and the life, difference between the two. Okay, life and death is actually <laughs> coexist. So for us, there are three kinds of death in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. One is moment-to-moment -moment death. Another one is conventional death. Another one is ultimate death, which is actually deathless. The deathless. Yes. Yeah, so the, we start with the first one. The first one is pretty much easy if you understand the five processes. I've just talked about the body. Mm -hmm. The body is dying all the time and is renewing itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's called a moment to moment death, psychological death. We call it psychological death. Mm -hmm. So that one is not so much bad news because you're still al alive, but cells are dying and new ones are being born, you know? Mm -hmm. So bo birth and death simultaneous happening. Yeah? Then uh, also feelings, new ones are coming, old ones are gone. Same with perception, same with mental formation. Then consciousness, awareness, so it's changing all the time. So that's called the death, the first death, psychological death. The second one <coughs> is very common. That's when uh, the body mm -hmm. and the mind get separated. In other words, when heat, consciousness and life incense, what to call the life incense. There are three things when they get separated from the body, then we call that death according to Buddhism. One is heat, heat elements. Yeah. That's why we touch somebody who's dead is cold. Mm -hmm. So there's no heat, there's no life incense, and then there is no also uh, consciousness. In other words, uh, there's no consciousness like the nail. The na nail doesn't have consciousness and the hair. Two parts of the body don't have consciousness. So now, if all the body is devoid of consciousness, and then uh, we say that death has happened, so then uh, that's the second kind of death. We call it conventional death because after sometimes it's accident, sometimes it's after one's lifespan. Uh, they ripe, they are right, they have ripen. Let's say eighty years or seventy. It varies. Others they are born. And then they die in, uh, after one year or after one day, after one minute. So this death is very, very common. And that's we, uh, we understand that that death is followed by birth. When you die like that, whether it's an accident, immediately you actually get uh, conceived in a, another lifetime. I mean, uh, life existence. It might be here, it might be in Uganda. So you, you, you actually uh, create conditions because of what you've done, what we call karmic impressions, so you are born and uh, almost, uh, it's like uh, we can compare it to sunset and sunrise. Mm -hmm. When the sun sets here, it rises to another place. Mm -hmm. so then there's another kind of death, we don't call it death as well, we call it deathless, is when you attain enlightenment. That's when you attain uh, what you call awakening. Mm -hmm. And then when you attain awakening, you have uh, gotten rid of all mental defilements and then you are no longer holding on to the five processes and clinging on to them so you have overcome clinging you have uh, 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 what you call overcome greed hatred and delusion through the practice of meditation you actually have achieved enlightenment and at the moment of your end of your life we we say that you have attained the deathless Mm -hmm. or Nibbana, maybe deathless. That's the kind of uh, uh, attitude we have towards life and death. Mm -hmm. mm. Questions? Four or five questions. Oh, great. That will be, it'll be quick. One, uh, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, so, what's the weather like today, just to get some sound on you? Well, the How weather you? is very friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, not sunny, but it's, uh, it's a bit warm. It's oh. great, yeah. So it reminds me of Africa. <laughs> Yeah. So you say that you've specifically come to embrace communities of colour mm -hmm. um, and immigrant communities who are having a tough time in mm -hmm. the US at the moment and could perhaps use the Buddhist word that mm -hmm. you have to offer. Right. So in essence, why have you come at this moment and to this community to offer your message? What do you have to tell them? 
Well, I have to tell uh, the people here uh, in this community, uh, whether immigrant or from Africa, that peace is possible, happiness is possible, and we can cultivate peace and happiness with, from within. It doesn't have to come from outside. That's the message I have to come, I've come to give this, my brothers and sisters here. Is it your sense we're here just outside of New York City in a community that's gone through economic hard times? Is it your sense that Buddhism mm. has a particular message that perhaps other faiths yes. have not provided? Yes, I believe so because uh, uh, when I see uh, uh, Buddhism, it's uh, human-centered. Uh, uh, so it teaches human values, it, it teaches how to connect with others, and uh, it, it teaches how to meditate and cultivate these values within oneself. But I feel that uh, most of other traditions might be missing out on really uh, self-reliance and they rely so much on external conditions. Well, let me ask you this, mm. what is it you see, just for visual sense, what is it you see around you when you come into this community? I see a lot of uh, uh, lack of peace, I see people uh, like uh, worried about life, uh, they have to make both ends meet. And I feel that people are not peaceful in general when I look outside like this. And but with, when I come here, I would like to offer them some tools that actually can bring happiness and peace, even regardless of their economic situations in life. I see this in, when I look in the faces of people. They don't look very happy, just like in Africa. In Africa, people don't have a lot of money, but they're smiling. <laughs> they're not so worried. But I see people a little bit uptight here. He said, I want to give a big smile through meditation, through loving kindness, through uh, compassion, through connection with, with each other, brother, as brothers and sisters. So that's what I have to give him. That's interesting. And the uh, leaflet that was handed out about your visit says that you um, are offering a meditation retreat that's specifically for those people from communities of color mm. who are immigrant Americans or reside in America and consider themselves indigenous, enslaved, colonized, disenfranchised. <laughs> yes. That's a tall task. <laughs> yes, yes. It is because I think all of these people, all of these communities, what they're really looking for is to be peaceful, to be happy. No, none of these communities want to suffer. No, no. They want to be happy. They want to be peaceful. So that's why we're going to have a retreat tomorrow and that's will bring us together irrespective of our background. So what is it that you're offering for those who are not Buddhists and don't understand your beliefs? What is it that you have to offer these communities in this difficult time, <laughs> an anti-immigrant, seemingly anti-working people time in America? Right. Well, I'm giving the same message. I'm meditation. Giving, uh, meditation, uh, how to cultivate peace and happiness through meditation. And you don't have to be a Buddhist to do so. That's the good news. You don't have to sign up to be a Buddhist to do meditation. Anybody who can breathe can meditate. So if those people from different backgrounds, uh, irrespective of their religion, country, gender, whatever, if they, can know, they, if they know how to breathe in and breathe out, then they can meditate and they can cultivate peace and happiness that is spring from within. That's the message I'm giving them. And your leaflet suggests that in some ways communities of color are not at peace in part because of who's in the White House at the moment creating a mood that is not peaceful. Yes, definitely, because when you create... Uh, Should we call his name? Uh, well, his name you can call him, but in Uganda we call people like that. I had to call them the principal because if you keep on calling their name, like maybe uh, Trump, then this and this, then people get a little bit worried. But if they use the word principal, yeah, the principal is doing ABC. The principal in the White House is doing like this. That takes away some kind of personal stuff. But uh, when I look at in general, uh, whoever is in the office, uh, is dividing uh, people and uh, it doesn't matter which country, whether it's my country or any message that you are bringing that is dividing people, they're of course not peaceful. So for me, what I just feel that uh, even when there's somebody in the office and dividing people, they 
truth is that we need to be inside, not divided. Because individually, we can create conflicting interests and we are divided inside ourselves. So the message I'm bringing is actually to see how we can connect inside, internally, to connect with our body, with our mind through meditation. And then when we do that, we are going to create peace within ourselves. And when I create peace within myself, then I'll create peace within my friend, uh, with the, I mean with my friends, and uh, with the community, with the society, and with the country. See, it all starts with ourselves. That's interesting. So you're looking to create peace and to create Buddhist communities yeah. in these communities of color. Yeah. Now, interestingly, mm. coming out of Uganda, right. what, you've had some success yes. introducing Buddhism to Uganda, your home country, right. and to other parts of Africa. Tell us about your um, success and achievements with uh, the growing of the Buddhist faith in, in Africa. Yes, I studied Buddhism in Uganda in 2005. And then it was not very easy for me because most people thought I was a Shaolin master. Other people thought like that Shaolin master like Kung Fu. Yeah, Kung Fu, and people had uh, a lot of fear because they thought that I'm a witch. Also, they thought that uh, I'm a, um, I'm, uh, I'm weird the way I dress, and it was very very difficult. But recently, what I did is to create projects that help support people, like water project in Kampala, in, 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 in Tebe. Uh, I created projects like uh, women empowerment projects that help women to uh, achieve economic equality and uh, increase their income. Then uh, I, I, I established projects like water projects to provide clean water to the community. And then people start really associating with me and then they came to the temple because they had to get clean water anyway so then they so the message i was bringing it's actually called the message of peace and that's our vision peace for all so they were so happy and then we had a program of meditation and the christian father and christian nuns they were so afraid that i'm going to convert them i asked them wait a minute wait a minute when you speak english you become an englishman or English woman? He said, no, no, no. I asked them, okay, when you speak English, do you forget African language? They said, no, no, no. So then they actually signed up for meditation. And then I taught them meditation. And they asked me, where are we going? You haven't talked about God. I mean, <laughs> then I said, no, we are actually going to achieve peace. So then they stayed and did the retreat with me. And they were very happy. After the end of the retreat, they told me, Yes, I'd like to be your disciple. So That's they want to come to the temple. That's so true. it's very successful in Uganda. Buddhism is very successful in Uganda because we are teaching peace and happiness. Who doesn't want to be happy or peaceful? Well, and it. peace and happiness not only for Buddhists. Of course. Now yeah. you're talking there about converts. Yeah. The chief, your very first converts there in uh, Uganda were amongst your own family, correct? Yes, of course. My mother was the first one to convert to Buddhism. But actually, most that's quite an achievement. Yeah, that's a big achievement, I think. But the, the thing that uh, I actually the truth that she converted herself. Buddhism is not a converting religion. We convince people, but we don't convert them. This means I show up, I talk about peace and happiness, and if people want it, it's a buffet. People can choose, and that's how my mother chose to join me. In fact, in Uganda, I've never asked anybody to convert into Buddhism. But what I do though, I ask them, can you convert from suffering to happiness? And I found out many people want to convert from suffering to happiness. So it's self-conversion. I don't convert people. So many people have joined me, in, apart from my mother. I have cousins. Let me put and, that question to you. Yeah. Now, now that's interesting. You convert, well, your mother has joined you in the Buddhist faith, which is wonderful. Mm. But just how large is the Buddhist community there in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa? But first of all, in Uganda. Actually, in Uganda, the Buddhist community, uh, if we add also expatriates, it's about 500 people. Sri Lankans are many, like over 400 Sri Lankan, Thai, Burmese. But the local people, the local people is about 25 people who are 25? Really, yes, 25 people. So you have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of work to do, but the thing is, what's very interesting, we have even more than 25 local Ugandans who don't 
call themselves Buddhists, but they do actually participate in our activities. But we are talking about those people whom I've given names, even Buddhist names, who really say, yes, I've now converted. So the number is even unknown to me because when people come to Uganda Buddhist Center, I don't ask them whether they, are go they want to be Buddhist or not. <laughs> yes, so, but the number is very large, actually. Right. But at least I can say 25 at minimum. So now and, and all of this is taking place in Entebbe yes. at the Uganda Buddhist Centre that you founded. There. Yes, all that is taking place in Entebbe because this is the only and the, actually this is the first and the only Buddhist temple in Uganda. So all what I'm talking about is happening in Entebbe and beyond Entebbe because Entebbe is only one town. So it's taking place in the whole of Uganda because being this, the only temple in Uganda. But around the Africa, we found out actually temples in different countries, like we found a few temples in Africa, in South Africa, we found a temple in, in Malawi, then Botswana, there's a couple of temples, Congo, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Though out of 54 countries, about seven countries have temples actually. Yeah, and in fact, you went for a journey to nearby Kenya. Yes. And that was an interesting story because you were traveling with a very with a Buddhist statue. Yes, I did so actually. <laughs> and when I arrived in Kenya and uh, I, I met Masai's and uh, they thought um, uh, we are brothers and sisters, which is, we are actually, and they, they could relate very well with me. So that was fun to be in Kenya, but the unfortunate part is traveling with the Buddha statue and people thought I was smuggling drugs when I reached <laughs> at the airport. You're serious? Yes, they thought I, 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 I'm smuggling drugs. I said, no, I'm a Buddhist monk. They said, no, 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 we have to check. And then they said, ah, is this your God? And then they cautioned me, please don't sell this thing in Kenya. I said, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm not a businessman. So then I took the statue in Uganda. All right. Now, it's been quite a journey for you. You leave in your 20s from home in Uganda to go to India to mm. study business. Yes. Uh, and you leave as Stephen Kabagoza. Definitely. You return as? Uh, Buddha Rakita. Bante Buddha Rakita. By the way, I like your pronunciation of African name, Kabogoza. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere along this journey, this uh, religious journey, you, you, you become a scuba diver as well? Y yes, actually. Is that a Buddhist thing? No, actually it's not a Buddhist thing, you know, when I was in India as a student, I had no fun, you know, every time studying and spirituality and meditation. I said, let me have a little bit of fun, you know, as a young man, I'm not a monk, I said, hey, oh, go for it. So I went to uh, learn uh, swimming and uh, in India, then I, later on Thailand, I learned what to call snorkeling and then later on scuba diving and then I started to really enjoy my life. And moreover, when I became a Buddhist, people didn't like me very much at home. They thought I ab abandoned them in their Christian tradition. So then I had no income, I had no support at home. So I wanted to earn more money so that I can uh, attend retreats and travel and see the world. Yes, I became a scuba dive instructor actually and I, I made a lot of uh, uh, friends and good, I, I, I got money to move around the world. So yes, that was a wonderful time for me. But I wasn't a monk, mind you. You weren't a monk at that no, time? No, no, I was just a lay person. All right. Yeah, trying to have a, uh, make a living and have fun. And so Yeah. All right. So coming fi finally to it, I mean, you're here in the United States bringing the word of peace. Yes. And uh, cooperation, of Buddhism, happiness. happiness, and yeah. so on. And togetherness, so that we're one, not uh, divided on either economical and uh, economic lines or tribal country or gender all these things that are, this message is to really dismantle all these walls that divide us because right. divided and, and, and before. Let, let me put that to you as a question mm. i mean and, and you really believe that buddhism mm. not the christianity you grew up with yeah not islam not mm. other faiths that right. are available in africa you think buddhism can be the savior for conflict civil war and other forms of tribal and strife between people in Africa? I believe so. If we can all get lost into mindfulness meditation and Buddhist principles, because you don't have to be a Buddhist, then we are going to be very, very peaceful because I think the Buddha's teaching is all about peace. And is there something special about Uganda, you think, that if you're going to begin to introduce Buddhism anywhere in Africa right. to locals, is that the best place to do it, you think? Uh, is there something about 
I mean, I know you're from Uganda, but I'm thinking, is Uganda's likely to be more receptive right. and less cynical right. and less skeptical? Right. Is it something about Ugandans that will perhaps make them particularly open to the embrace of Buddhism? I think, yes, uh, the thing about Uganda, they're very friendly, not because I come from Uganda, <laughs> yes, but also they're very Christian, and, but also I think the Ugandans, people like to be African, so the way I introduce uh, Buddhism in Uganda is actually within a cultural context, so in other words, I'm promoting African wisdom and our culture and values, and Ugandans love their African culture and values. So locals are not giving up something, they're mm -hmm. getting something. It definitely, because as I'm introducing Buddhism in Africa and in Uganda specifically, specifically I'm not bringing Buddhism from Asia. No, I'm mixing it with what we call African wisdom. For example? For instance, uh, we have a saying uh, in, uh, in Uganda, Kariada Kadada Envunyo Jirida Mkatiko Ekusanga Montana. Yeah, I know that very well. Yeah, you know that very well. But maybe that's difficult. But let's take a simple example in Uganda. It's from Japadora. It means uh, uh, there's nobody, I'm translating it in English, there's nobody who is too poor not to give, and there's nobody who is too rich not to receive. That's about generosity. So now I'm using such proverb when I go back to Africa, I, I start with African proverb and I say there's nobody who is too poor not to give and nobody who is too rich not to receive. That's how I start my teaching. So now I'm teaching them African values. I'm, I'm reviving our Ugandan culture. Now once I start like this, then I can bring a little bit of spice from Buddhism. So then already they will embrace what my message because I'm starting from where they, were, they are. They are. Not from, oh, yo, please come and learn Buddhism is the best religion, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. I start with our tradition values. Even the one of uh, the love karma. African Buddhism. Yeah, African Buddhism. So I'm branding it. I'm bringing the best of Africa and the best of uh, Eastern philosophy. And of course, also because I was born as a Christian, I, bring, I also bring the best of uh, Christianity. Sounds because, good. Yeah, sometimes uh, I talk about uh, contentment. And when I was doing my Christian religio religious studies, uh, I learned that, uh, uh, that I was crying that I had no shoes until I found somebody who had no legs. So I always bring those kind of uh, th uh, nuggets of wisdom from also Christianity. So you can see I'm imagining three things here. Christianity, African wisdom, and, uh, and culture values, and Buddhism. You cannot resist that. Sounds wonderful. I did forget to ask you one question my producer wanted to put, which is, how would you answer people in Uganda, elsewhere in Africa, who would say, listen, the last thing we need is more religion, is more religious strife. We don't need a new religion. Perhaps we need less religion. Yes. And no thanks to Buddhism. Right. Well, people who told me that we don't need a religion, I tell you, welcome to Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome Buddhism because Buddhism is more than a religion. Buddhism is more than a way of life. Buddhism is more than science. Buddhism is more than psychology. Buddhism is more than philosophy. So people who say no, no more religion for me, I say okay, no. Does the breath have a religion? They say no, the breath has no religion. Let us breathe together. So then I can spread Buddhism like that. That's the first thing I tell them that you don't have to be a Buddhist, you don't have to have a religion, and Buddhism is more than a religion. So you cannot even say Buddhism is not a religion, you cannot say that Buddhism is a religion, it's not, none of that, it's the truth. Excellent. Yeah. And that's finished. I just, there is a couple of clips from your site online, I just want to introduce them, because we're going to use some of them to say, here you are at the center, mm. so it will be, and, and, here you are, and here you are chanting mm. Mm. on YouTube. Right. And here you are at the opening of the Buddhist center in Uganda, which drew the attention of local television. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Namo Buddhaya. Deeply uh, concerned mm. about the condition of uh, Africans mm. in America. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, there has been oppression for the last 400 years. Mm -hmm. People have been enslaved. And, yes, sir. And, and under this oppression that still goes on today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Mm -hmm. What do you think of mm. African Americans? Do you know any of the history? Do you know 
what they uh, have been through and are going through, and then I will follow up. Yes. So now there are two things here. What's it called African Americans who are gone through all Africans who were brought captured, brought to America and yes. enslaved. Yes, that one is one part. But also there's an influx of Africans who didn't were not part of the mm -hmm. that. So we have two sets of Africans here. Mm -hmm. One is African Americans, another one the people are coming now here. Which are you interested in? Both. Both of them. And there was the question again? Because Okay. Mm. How do you see I ask you if you knew any of the history I knew the history the history of the of them and the, I, I watched the roots and I've lived here for a long time also. Oh fantastic. Yeah. You you were in roots? Yes. I, I, I saw the whole videos on roots. Oh you watch roots? I watched the roots and then okay. uh, yeah and I've lived here for a long time too. Yeah, I've lived here and I'm a also I'm a, also a US citizen too. All right. So how do you see? So I can, in this society, I'm not brand new. I can watch what's going on here because I've lived here also okay. for many years in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. How how I, give me your interpretation of how you see the African American in the context of what he's been through. But not only uh, has he built. America physically, he's also built America intellectually. Right. Uh, his his um, his uh, his contributions yes. to the infrastructure of every aspect of right. America right. has been profound. Right. But how do you see the mm. African American, and how do you see his role in uh, evolving and helping the world? evolve right. into a more peaceful, into the uh, space mm. which you are teaching mm -hmm. how to bring it about. Yeah, you see, um, when I look at uh, African Americans and uh, their history, uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, they have contributed to this country, especially when it was still an, as an agricultural country, the sugar cane, Mississippi, cotton, uh, all these uh, cash crops. If we are not Africans, American will not be America will not be the way it is now because we relied so much on agricultural products back then. And when you look at uh, also the music they came with, the culture they came with, it has enriched American society. You know the sports, the music, the jazz, the, I mean, the lightness, the, and also, you look at also their uh, health, physical, they were very healthy, they were very healthy, and that's why they had to bring them here because the Indians, they, uh, they were dying, the diseases, so the Africans were more resistant, so then uh, that's how they, they contributed to the economy, in terms of economics, they contributed a lot and they are still contributing. Then I can see spiritually also, of course, uh, they had uh, stripped off everything, so they had to belong in a certain church. And uh, much of the, our African religions and tradition uh, actually lost a little bit, but still I can see drumming going on in African Americans. They still value their African roots. The way they dress, the way they drum, the way they eat okra, and all the, many things I can see they still didn't die out. I think that's a very good thing. And also now because they because of education, they are they are well educated as opposed to last time when they could they are segregated. They could not go to the, these universities like Harvard and all this. So now it's more open, though there's still some kind of suppression, but I see they are really part of the cream of the, the country, and they have a lot of potential to continue to uh, develop the country, like even Obama, you know. So these are the fruits of what African Americans have achieved over the past years. But what I can see also, because of the, uh, what you call uh, systematic oppression, which is called institutionalized oppression, they're only being given a chance. And uh, I think once that goes, I don't know when, I think their contribution will be even more because I think there's a lot of the system itself 
really uh, debuzz them to really contribute fully as other people you know, from Norway, from other places. So that's the sad news, but the good news is that the, um, if the, there's the opening to cultivating the mind and the kind of overcome some of their limitation, and there's even a saying which say, challenge your limit, don't limit your challenges. Mm. Yes, so I just feel that most of the time it's very easy to <coughs> to get into what they call uh, trauma. There's, somebody even has researched about post-slavery trauma syndrome. It's like really not able to move forward because of a certain limitation. You've been in part, in kind of uh, limited by the society. It's like a, an experiment of a bird. The, it's lived in a cage for a long time and when they remove the cage it cannot even fly further than that. So what I call for action is the African Americans to uh, re remember that there's no cages, at least physical cages, and they have the potential to really jump higher than actually st stopping where they used to stop. So I think the, the, the world is new uh, now, it's not uh, back in 100 years where we have limitations. Now there are many limitations which have been removed, but we can limit ourselves because we always in the old story, what we call trauma. So what is going to help is more of the, uh, for me, I believe in developing the mind, like me meditation, which doesn't have any religion, and then people can start think afresh, open a new leaf, and then go forward, instead of actually getting stagnant, stagnated. Mm -hmm. Yes. Welcome, everyone, this evening. We are uh, very fortunate to be in the presence of Bonte Guruatita from Uganda, and he is in town for uh, several special events, and uh, we thank Greg for uh, allowing us to have the space this evening to uh, really introduce uh, two of Bonte's uh, books, Planting Dhamma Seeds, which uh, will really give you a great you know, background and it's uh, like an autobiography, kind of, uh, kind or of. The, your journey, kind of, kind of. Mm. Um, um, but um, I see this book um, as being a great background to um, what uh, the, well, as the title says, the emergence of Buddhism in Africa. And then this book, Sowing Seeds of Peace, is a really great, like a guidebook for mindfulness in eating, in your, maybe your daily practice, in interacting with other people. Um, so I think the combination of these two books, and we'll hear a lot more about it from uh, Bonte this evening. And we'll also have a, uh, the books are available for sale, and we'll have a, well, book signing at the end of the event. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. So I thought we can start with a, a 15 minutes meditation. Is that okay? Mm. Yeah, because we are talking about sowing seeds of peace. <laughs> And uh, talking is not enough. So the poor, the proof of the pudding is the eating. <laughs> so now we need to really uh, practice meditation for 15 minutes. If you can't hear me, uh, you can come closer. Yes, uh, so I think coming closer would be very helpful. If you can't hear me, so there's a lot of space here. You can come closer if you want. So just come closer. You. I can come close if you. <laughs> we can just push this one like this, and I'm close. <laughs> and I'm close enough, I can assure you. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's good. I mean, because there's a lot of background noise in there. Okay, so 
Let us take 15 minutes of meditation. Okay, sit comfortably, feel at ease. See if you can abide in the present moment. Let go of the past and the future. Let go of the past and the future and abide in this present moment, however way it presents itself. As you do that, very soon you notice that there's a lot of noise in the background. Don't reach out for them. Just be mindful of hearing, hearing, hearing. You don't have to make the noise stop or make it longer, but you can be aware of it. Then you are at peace with the noise instead of being in conflict, in conflict with noise, you are at peace. Then you bring your mind to pay attention to the body sitting here. Relax your body, starting from the jaws, around the neck, shoulders, Put your hand in a way that you don't squeeze your lungs, but you open them so that you breathe as normal as possible. Pay attention to the body. The body is sitting here and the mind knows that the body is sitting here. And once you have settled in your body, then you can come to the breath. So from sound to the body, now to the breath. So you can see this gradual transition from external world to the internal world, from gross to subtle. Now pay attention to the breath. Where do you feel the breath more distinctly? As you breathe in and out. Maybe at the nostril, you can be aware of the breath as it comes in and go. Maybe the rise and the fall of abdomen. You can just choose one and pay unbridled attention to what's arising in the present moment. If you choose to stay with the nostrils, you can be mindful of the breath from the beginning of up breath to the end of it. Beginning of in breath to the end of it. And start seeing your attention. The sound is in the background. And we allow mindfulness to be at the forefront. Here is the rule of thumb of meditation is be mindful of what's arising in the present moment whenever it becomes prominent. Maybe sounds are becoming prominent. You can be aware of hearing and come back to the breath. Maybe as you're breathing, sometimes thoughts arise, a sensation arises, emotion. You could be mindful of it and then come back. You anchor your attention at the break. Breath by breath. One moment at a time.
it. Sometimes like, time looks shorter when you meditate. <laughs> Is that true for all of you? <laughs> yes. So now we have finished meditation. But we have not finished actually meditation. We have studied. <laughs> so you never finish meditation. <laughs> We are supposed to be always in a meditation mode. Only when we are fast asleep, then we are no longer in that mode. Because we don't see. But as in our wakeful time, we should be vigilant of what's going on in our thoughts, in our body. We pay attention to our body as we are sitting. When I say let us end our meditation, is I'm ending leading it. <laughs> <laughs> So really, when you look at meditation, uh, it means to develop your mind. Yesterday I was leading meditation, I asked people, I was in Cambridge, I asked them five questions about meditation. What's meditation? Why we meditate? How to meditate? When to meditate? And who's meditating anyway? <laughs> Do we know all those five questions? Oh, we just meditate. <laughs> most, I found out from my experience, most people come and meditate, and then they don't know what's even meditation, <laughs> or even why they meditate, or even how to meditate. You know. So anyway, this is not my talk today. <laughs> Maybe I can give this talk tomorrow about the five questions about meditation. Any meditator should know those five questions. What are they? What's meditation? Why meditation? How to meditate? When to meditate? And who meditates? If you, 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 you sit here and come to meditate and you don't know those five questions, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> I have no idea. And a follow-up question, how, how do I know that I'm meditating? How do I know? <laughs> That's simple to answer. When you sit and you know that you are sitting, then you are meditating. <laughs> when you breathe and you know that you are breathing, then you are meditating. I'm just uh, being asked by BBC about uh, when you go to teach in Africa. There are many religions. Are those people not tired of the religion? <coughs> Buddhism is yet another religion. Oh, give us a break. <laughs> you know, I said no. Buddhism. To me, it's beyond a religion. If you can breathe and know that you are breathing, then you are meditating. Then you can practice Buddhism. You know, you don't have to sign your okay, I'm a Buddhism. Uh, you sign your soul. You know, now I'm a Buddhist in order to do that. And guess what? The breath has a psychological and a physiological effect on you. Whether you're Buddhist or not, when you take a deep breath. I like you to breathe together. Breathe in and then breathe out. Breathe in together and breathe out. Breathe in together and breathe out. And now open your eyes. Now everybody can enjoy the benefit of mindful of breathing <laughs> because you breathe in and know that you are breathing. So now you are meditating. So you gain the benefit. You feel relaxed. Eh? You, whether you like or not, you are going to get the benefit of being mindful of breathing. Especially if you do it properly from the diaphragm. You breathe from the diaphragm. Not breathing from here like this. Most people uh, they breathe like. <laughs> Yes, you have to take a deep breath so that you get all the oxygen, all the oxygen, you know, you need. Babies can breathe better than us. Babies, they breathe very well. For us, we have forgotten the adult breathing at the cost of modern life. Yes, at the altar, we have sacrificed the proper old breathing at the altar of modern life. Now we are so divorced. <laughs> we are so busy, you know. Yeah, we are so busy, we can't breathe properly. 
the life is so busy. So now we are no longer bringing from the diaphragm. We are coming here, 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 here. And if you are really disappointed, road rage, I'm telling you, you're going to breathe from your nose. No, not from your nose. You, 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 you are not driving. <laughs> you see? Anyway, let's talk about books. There are two books. <laughs> All right. Okay, which came first? This one or this one? <laughs> Chicken and egg, I don't know which one. <laughs> anyway, here, these are not only my books. Actually, there are about five books. They are already have written five books. One is uh, called, man, uh, it's called the Buddhism and Environment. Uh, it's actually the title is Care for Our Planet. Because for me, I see this planet as our home. And if you don't care, <laughs> you, take, you don't take care of your home. Yes, so that book was published in Sri Lanka and uh, at the university and it was circulated by the university. I don't, have, I don't know if they still have copies. It was not for sale. So it was published by university. I was still studying there and it's green and it was launched by the president of Sri Lanka. So then I have another book called Drop by Drop and then there's another book, uh, uh, Drop by Drop, they pra uh, practicing Dharma and Day Life. And then there's another book, Attempted Murder. So five books all together. But at least this is the first two books published in the United States. Uh, this is revised. These are revised editions, right? So myself, I'm very happy this is my first book. <laughs> revised one, of course. The first one was printed in 2006, and it's, it's in five languages. It's in five languages. This book is in five languages. It is in Chinese. Somebody read it and was laughing. It's, the mother said, you are crazy. What are you? You are going mad. Why, why are you laughing like that? The man said, I'm reading this book of an African. <laughs> and then they said, let us put it in Chinese. So right away, they put it in Chinese. Then from there, an African got hold of this book in the Senegal and now this guy was so impressed and he was a Muslim <laughs> and then translated it in Spanish uh, what he calls uh, uh, French it's in the French right away it's, uh, it was published in Malaysia but in French then there is a Thai language they published it somebody in London found this book and he found it was such an interesting story and then he worked on publishing it actually in Thailand. And the, it was a big launch, I was there. And the, all the proceedings of this book went to Nepal victims because of earthquake. But originally, all the proceedings were supposed to come to Uganda. But, but it coincided, the, the launch coincided with the, uh, an earthquake in, in, uh, in Nepal, a Buddhist country, a uh, Hindu country, of course, officially, but there's a lot of Buddhist monuments were affected. So all the money went to Nepal. All of it, not even a single coin that came to Uganda. All of the proceeding. It was a big launch actually. Many people. We are talking about over 5,000 people when they were launching this book. It was in Thai language. Then another one is in, the, in the Singhalese, in Sri Lankan language. Then the rest is in the, the Portuguese and Spanish. They haven't published it. So uh, there's another book, Drop by Drop, is uh, French, I don't know, it's in Spanish, and also in uh, Portuguese, drop, drop by Drop. And the less popular book, which is called Attempted Murder of a Buddhist Monk, is not so popular, <laughs> it's quite another book. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about this. <laughs> so, this book, Planting Dharma Seeds, uh, to me, it really talks about my story, and they use, I use the word planting because when I look at my story, it's not yet over. It's still going on, it's still going on. And I like a quote from uh, Henry David Thoreau, Thoreau, is, I have a great faith in a seed. Convince me that you have a seed there and I'm prepared to expect wonders. So for me, every day is wonders to me. Every day is wonders since I started planting the seeds. So now, how did I end up here? I don't know myself. 
just like have a seed, you plant a seed there and you find out you have around five fruits. <laughs> you don't know whether you're going to get 20, but your job to is put a seed there and nurture it. Exactly that's what I did. When I left Uganda, I'll talk more about this book actually. When I left Uganda to start a business in, in India, I had no idea what I was getting into. It's only to reach in India, and the flu was so hot and say, no, get me out of this place. <laughs> so I even sent a letter by DHL to home, and I said, please get me out of this place. <laughs> the food was so hot. The culture was so different from Africa. Being in India, those who have been to India, raise your hand if you have been in India. Yes. I mean, with the contrast with the African culture, is so different. The food is so different. Yet, actually, when you look at spirituality, it's so connected. Spiritually, we are connected by the food is different, the culture is different, and all these things. So now, that's when I started going into a world of unknown. But this seed actually started from Africa. It started with my mother, who loved me so much. He never forced me to believe in anything. He was very gentle. In this, you find a story here where, where when he say, when she said that uh, if you have nothing to do, sleep, and if you have nothing to say, keep quiet. For me, those principles actually were the seeds that came later on sprout. Because if I don't have anything to do, I meditate. <laughs> if I have nothing to say, I keep quiet. Yes, and even up to now, most people ask me when I'm in Uganda, well, you don't talk about Buddhism. How are you going to fill all your temple? Your temple is very big. How how is it going to be filled up? You know, how are you going to fill it? I tell sometimes that I like to listen more and talk less. That's why we have two ears and one mouth. <laughs> we should listen more and talk less. <laughs> yes, but of course I allow people to ask questions because already there are many people talking and people are not listening. <laughs> And even if sometimes I go to conferences and say, wow, you didn't talk so much. They no, I say I was listening a lot. Yeah, so anyway, my mother planted those seeds. And those are the seeds that helped me when I came to meditation. Because in the meditation, uh, you, don't, you don't talk. <laughs> you keep quiet. So I was comfortable with silence as a fear. Sometimes most people are afraid of silence. It's a punishment in many cultures. When people misbehave, go in your room and keep quiet. Don't watch TV, you know. <laughs> keep quiet as a punishment. But for me, it's, I embrace silence as a seed to spiritual growth. Any spiritual teacher, they, they encourage silence. In fact, the word for silence uh, is called, uh, I mean, we, in our tradition, we call it noble silence. Keep total silence and meditate. So when I heard that we have to keep silence, and my mother told me to keep quiet. I said, wow, welcome. <laughs> yeah, so now that's where the seeds were planted. But also, as a young boy, like him, I think, I used to go to school, and when I came back, I'll spend more time in gardens, looking at flowers. All the boys would reach home, and for me, I would reach always maybe after 30 minutes. They asked me, tell us, where have you been? <laughs> So for me, I was always in the garden, looking at flowers, enjoying seeing bees, <laughs> all these butterflies. I was really enjoying when I was a kid like him. So I had those seeds before Buddhism came in my life. Now, how I end up here, it may not be written actually how I end up here, but I'm, I'm going to tell you today. There are four principles of four wheels of success. We call them the four wheels of success. Like wheels of the car, you know? There are four of them. And uh, when I look at these four wheels of success, it, I can see how I moved all the way from Africa and be a Buddhist monk. And you can use these four wheels of success in your life to see how you can progress in just about anything. Whether it's business, whether it's friendship, whether it's spirituality, those few four wheels of success underpins what you will be reading this book. Not written, it's a, uh, now it's an article 
in the spirit of Buddha's teaching, but let me spell them out for you. The first will is called associating with the wise people and not associate with unwise people. You can say associate with the trained people, not associate with the second will is called residing in a suitable place. Residing in a suitable place. The third will is having done good things in the past. And then the fourth will is establishing yourself in the right path. If that's metaphysics, let us start with business. <laughs> in a business, you need business associates, is it? Don't you? You need a business associates. You need people who are in the same line of business to start business. Is that it? And then you have to form partnership with people doing the same thing. Yeah. Then whether you are even in the past. Right? So in this case, as a business person, you must have ethics for the business. Right? Mm -hmm. If you have accumulated many debts <laughs> and if you have not paid your business associates, <laughs> and everybody said, no, you don't have a, 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 a good, uh, what you call, uh, credit, uh, what you call, uh, how they evaluate somebody who's uh, having good uh, ethics in getting money and uh, giving it back and values, good values in business, you pay your debtors and all these things. It's very, very important you have done good things in the past. In other words, you cannot come from nowhere and get business associates and locate your business somewhere. No, you mm -hmm. must have done good things in the past and people say, no, you are actually prospering. No. Now, the fourth way of success in business or in life is establishing yourself in the right path. You have to choose the right business. You don't want to be, if your business is to sell books and, <laughs> and then you, 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 you end up with eggs, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the business, the, your associates said, no, our vision and the mission and values was like this. We, we didn't sign up to sell eggs. Yeah. They're going to fall in the street. <laughs> and then we have to shut business. So we need to establish ourselves in the right path. In other words, we might have to agree on our mission. We have to agree on our vision. We have to have core values for the business. Without that, Usually core values are six, but we can even spell them to be eight, right? We must have integrity, we must have compassion, we must have wisdom, we must have uh, uh, commitment, right? So is that not what we do in business? We stick to our core values and vision, we have mission, we stick to our core values, and then we get good friends. When we get good friends, we locate our business properly. We locate our business properly, then we do good things in the past, even when it means five minutes ago. That's exactly what you need to do in any undertaking. Now, for me, for this undertaking, what you see in this book is a story, and it's not a, actually my autobiography. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> this is not my autobiography. It was a vague attempt. This was a vague attempt for us to answer questions that most people ask me when I travel. Sometimes I have only two minutes to board the airplane. Say, are you an African monk? Please tell me how you become an African monk. Please, I'm missing my flight. <laughs> <laughs> so until my teacher told me to write a book that I'm gonna give people to answer this question. My autobiography will come after when I'm 70. Now I'm around 51. <laughs> so, I think you can wait. But as you are waiting, let us see why I ended up a Buddhist monk. Somebody who went to start a business. Is that not weird? <laughs> really? I never planned. I never planned this. But when you look at it clearly, I associated with the wise people. This is the Dalai Lama. When I went to India, the first thing I did is to meet these monks. I didn't plan for this, but I met Buddhist monks. And when I met Buddhist monks, it, I mean, they looked like my brothers in the past life. Already there were two guys, they, are, they, are from, they were Muslims, they are from also Uganda. They had spent almost two years 
in India without associating with these monks. But for me, as soon as I went there, I saw them, I said, wow, these are great people. Associate with them. They took me to markets, they could get, we got food, we ate together. Amazing. Slowly by slowly, I, I was asking them what their roles, what their religion, what they believe. And they answered this question. Associate with wise people. Train people. When you associate with the wise people, I'm telling you, you are going to be wise. In fact, re-evaluate your life. What you are is what the people you associate with. In fact, when you look at what you are now, is a total sum of people you associate with. They play a big chunk, a big chunk in your life. They play a big role in your life. If people you associate with, they are spiritual, they want to meditate, they are successful, they are holistic, they want to live a holistic life, you are going slowly by slowly change towards that direction. And that's why you see planting that seed. That seed was planted and that changed me slowly. I never even knew what Buddhism. All what I knew is Gautama. All, all of you, you have more information on Buddhism than me when I started in India. <laughs> because I knew only one word, Gautama. I think you know more than that. <laughs> I think my brothers and sisters, you know more than that. But through association, I build a vocabulary of Buddhism. I build a, a vocabulary of Buddhism that next year I will add my PhD in Buddhism. <laughs> next year. Come next year, I should get my PhD in Buddhism. Not for another degree, <laughs> but something I've worked for. Because I have passion for Buddhism. Because I knew it's, gone, it's what brings me happiness. And I knew it's what gets rid of suffering and spoils and I knew when I share with people that actually it's meditation is developing your mind. That's why I ask you what's meditation. Meditation is mental development. So when you do this mental development, then it's going to bring peace and eliminate or reduce what you call suffering. So now, that's the first way. Now, associate with the wise and don't associate with unwise people. Is that not discrimination? Well, <laughs> well, this is what I mean. Spend more time. Spend more time with wise people. Otherwise, it's dividing people between unwise and wise. is actually, again, creating suffering. What I mean here, associates with the wise people. And if you meet unwise people who are dragging you down, hmm, have compassion. Tell them your values. Stick to your values. This is what I stand for. No, 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 let's go to meditate. No, no, I want to just get a martini or get a uh, scotch. Walker? It's called Walker. Let's, let's uh, walk. Let's get some Walker before we go to the meditation. <laughs> come on, come on. Uh, Buddhism talks about uh, abstain from taking intoxicants that leads to heedlessness. Come on, let us have a middle path. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so uh, what you know. So then, before you know where you are, then you have taken one boat at least, and then you are heading for meditation. I have people that have, that have done that one in Uganda, and they, I ask people, why didn't you come to meditation? You see, you know, I needed something, you know. <laughs> This guy from England, I had a retreat, and I had bought food for them, this in Uganda. And then he didn't show up one day. I said, well, we waited for you. It was actually fast of January. And I thought, you come and bring in the New Year together. He said, you know, honestly, I didn't want to, <laughs> to be drunk in your retreat. But the first day was great. The second day, he was missing something. Yeah, so that's why I say. This is not about discrimination, it's about spending more time with the people who have values that you cherish. Right? The first will of success. Second will of success is suitable, suitable place. Live in a place where you have uh, access to people who are wise, to the teaching of meditation, the, teach, the Dharma teaching, people where you, 
a place where you have teachers who can teach these kind of things. A place where you can cultivate, where you can pretty much plant the seeds. <laughs> if you live in a barren land, it may be not so easy to plant the seeds. Huh? If you live in a place which has so many weeds, <laughs> you need to remove the weeds. I think this is a clear message that uh, you really have to find a suitable place. You know when people are setting up shops, they don't go in the middle of a forest. They come, they come I think, downtown <laughs> and make sure that their shops are here. That's why this shop is here. Where's the owner? I think the owner should tell us why he came here. Suitable place is very important for me. What was the suitable place for my case here? Was I was in India. And it was in India whereby nobody opposes what you are believe. In Africa, I had a hard time. When you don't go to church in Uganda, they start to say you are a devil worshiper. <laughs> then you get into problem because for us, as opposed to here in the United States or in Europe in general, in the Western country, every neighbor knows what you're doing. <laughs> if you don't go to church, the neighbors will get to know that. And when you meet them on the way, you say, I didn't see you on a, in a church. So it used to be like this maybe 500 years ago here. And some extent, actually, in the villages, I go to Massachusetts, I find people know each other. For me, when I, w I was going, uh, when I'm in Massachusetts, I still see places where they have tomatoes and they have put. Uh, uh, they, they are on the stalls, and then they put a box, you can drop money there, and then take the oranges and take the apples, and people give me apples in the countryside. I say, what went wrong in the cities? <laughs> I wish for me to go back to that life, whereby you can just pick apples and put money there. Now you do that in many cities, they take the apples first and box, and then you find nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and you all find air. But I'm surprised that in these cities, small, small towns of New England, you still find this kind of thing. So now, uh, when I was in India, I was properly located. I don't, I'm not saying go to India <laughs> also to be successful. But for me, what's behind all this is that I was in India and I met monks. That means I associated with one's people. And then being in India itself, I, was, I had freedom to explore whatever religion I want. That's why I, start, I, I went into uh, Baha'i. I became a Baha'i officially. Then from Baha'i, was, I was not satisfied with it. Then I went to uh, Sufism, Islam. And then the Sufism, I was not satisfied with it. Then I went to, ba, to Tibetan tradition. And then I was not satisfied with that, uh, with all the rituals and all that. I said, no, no, no. Then they asked me, please, Venerable, I mean, Stephen, my name was Stephen, tell us what's your religion. I told them my religion is life. I'm a student of life. Mm -hmm. And people who pinned me down and said, no, what's your religion? I'm say I'm a truth seeker. Mm -hmm. I'm seeking the truth. Please tell us your religion. No. <laughs> I, I was tired of this question. People wanted to belong, me to belong somewhere. When I return to Africa, people say, what are you? I say, I'm a Buddhist. They say, no, you're a devil. <laughs> you're a devil. Where's your Bible? I say, I have no Bible. I have Buddhist books. They say, where are they? I say, these books. They say, you pass, you Buddhist, you have a lot of philosophy. Burn all your books and get a Bible and then go to the church. So I was also disillusioned when I went to Africa. Then what I did is leave Africa and then go to South America to seek for a proper location where nobody is stopping from what I'm doing. In this book, you are going to see, you are going to see uh, say what you want and do whatever you want because people who matter don't, 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 don't mind and people who mind don't matter. <laughs> you are going to see this very soon. <laughs> yeah, so if you can really be in that space, you're going to read this in the book here. Yeah? So now, I wanted to be in South America, America and I knew nobody's going to bother about me. <laughs> Nobody will mind about what I'm doing. Again, location is very important. And now we go to the third wheel. 
the third wheel, having done good things in the past. Having done good things in the past. In other words, what are the, some of the virtues you have had? Not in the past or past life, but the last 10 minutes. That counts for your success. What have you done every moment? Every moment matters. Actually, what matters in life starts with a, a moment, to a second, to a minute, to one hour, to a week. To Actually, most people think that a second doesn't matter. A second, one second of your life doesn't matter. If you think one second of, of your life doesn't matter, talk to an athlete eh? who is about to reach the end line and one second the other person comes and wins it and just miss the gold medal. They will tell you the value of one second. Can you imagine that one second can make a difference between getting a gold medal and a silver medal? Can you believe it? So if you can value your life like this, that every moment battles and do good things, so that becomes a wheel of success. Because every moment is very, very important for speech of success, for business, and for everything. So time matters. Now we go to the third wheel of success, I mean the fourth is called establishing yourself in the right path. Now here we have problems here. We are talking about right path. And for business it's about vision, it's about mission, it's about also values. They have to be aligned. If your mission, vision is another thing, and your mission is another, and your core values are conflicting, are you going to be successful? Now, when coming to Buddhism, or this path we're talking about, establishing oneself in the right path, who said it's right? Is the Pope? The monk? Is there a wrong path? What do you think? I think there might be a wrong path for you. <laughs> there might be a right path for you, but not a right path. <laughs> okay, okay. You see, some of these things, the word right, is not so much as opposed to wrong, but is it integrated, is it holistic, is it in sync with human values, is it aligned with your vision, mission, and, uh, and uh, core values. Yes, the Buddha had a mission statement. The Buddha had a vision. Attaining ultimate happiness. Freedom from suffering. And the mission is to understand suffering, to abandon the cause of suffering, to realize ultimate peace and happiness, and to develop the path that leads to happiness. So you think universities have mission statements? We have mission statements. When you develop mindfulness, when you develop the path that leads to the happiness, you come to understand suffering. When you come to understand suffering, you abandon the cause of suffering. When you abandon the cause of suffering, you realize peace, you realize happiness. And for me, that's a right path. It doesn't matter who, whether you're Buddhist or not, because that's exactly what the doctor does. That's exactly what the doctor does. When there's a problem, whether conflict or whatever, let us take the template of the doctor. When you have a problem, you go to the doctor, he asks you what's the problem. She asks you what's the problem. Doesn't it? They ask, what's the problem? Why did you come here? <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a problem. I have a headache. Then the doctor will say, what's the cause? Maybe this and this. They find the cause. Then also they say, yes, you are going to heal. You are going to cure. They don't say, no, please stay here. You are going to die in the hospital. They tell you, no, we are going to treat this one. Is it? And then they prescribe the medicine. So in other words, they do the diagnosis, they lay, the, they lay out the etiology, they give the prognosis, and then they have prescription. That's what you get from a doctor. So now what I call this path that is the right path, because it's the right path to my problem. I have a problem. And this is the right path. The path there, the right path there, not as opposed to wrong, but something that is gonna, is integrated with its vision, with its mission, with its core values. What are the core values? Compassion, wisdom, understanding, uh, peace, and all these are values. Everybody, including insects, want to be peaceful. In case you are not sure, 
get a stick like this uh, when uh, when uh, when uh, an insect is walking oh it's just even the smallest one with this i don't know how much consciousness these insects have you put a stick like this i've never seen an insect which is going to climb the stick and go by it and when go it will just go like this the stick is here the insect as soon as it senses that there's a stick they'll go this way they will go like this. They will not endeavor to go up like this because that's hard work. <laughs> that's hard work. If an insect can do that, what about a human being? A human being, we as a human being, we all want peace. We don't want to suffer. And the path is there. And if you want to be successful, you have to follow the right path. And this right path is not Buddhist per se. It's not Buddhist per se. When you go to a doctor, do they ask whether they're Buddhist or not? <laughs> in order to use their template? The doctor uses the same template we find in, in Buddhism. Suffering, cause of suffering, happiness and the way to happiness. That's what the path that I found. That's the path that I found, my brothers and sisters. And that's the path that saved me. And that's the path that I came to embrace. And that's the path I came to be committed to. Because I knew it's going to really solve my problem. I had attempted many paths, born as a Roman Catholic, I love it. Became a Baha'i, I love it. I became a, a Buddhist, I love it. Which is better? I don't know. <laughs> which makes more sense for me is the path which is right. It integrates all aspects from different religion, from different religion. And it's not religion to me. It's more than a religion. It's more than a philosophy. It's more than a psychology. It's more than a way of life. It's more than everything. Because it's the truth. Suffering is the truth. <laughs> it's not a lie. <laughs> the cause of suffering is the truth. You can go and riot. <laughs> oh, that the cause of suffering is because of this and this and this. But the cause of suffering is very clear. Happiness is also the truth. Everybody wants to be happy, including an insect. And there's a way to this mess. There's a way out of this mess. So now let us recap the way to success is associate with the wise people, residing in a suitable place, having done good things in the past, and then establishing yourself in the right path. You see this happening. I've done good things in the past. That means I listened to my mother. <laughs> I listened to my mother. I didn't you know I a message. Right? And then, because of that, whoever I met, I was respecting their time. I was not trying to fill the gap when I have nothing to do, and I tried to waste people's time. I would keep quiet when I have nothing to talk. Then people know that I'm silent. And I was listening more than talking, though these days it's changing. <laughs> because I'm giving them a talk. <laughs> it's changing rapidly. <laughs> because I have to give them a talk. And also I established myself in the right path. That's why you found out going to meditation center. I came to the United States in 1999 to establish myself in the right path. And I did meditation for three months. For three months in 1999. How did I end up here in the United States? Somebody who was in India. <laughs> Again, because these are wheels. When the wheels are all running together, you cannot stop them from running. <laughs> Unless one get a puncture <laughs> and you get what you call flat tire syndrome. <laughs> flat tire syndrome is you establish yourself in the right path, but still you are holding on to wrong people who are derailing you. Oh, you are going to meditate? What's meditation? <laughs> and then, come on, let's go for vacation. <laughs> Then one wheel is going to have a puncture. Then maybe uh, establishing yourself uh, uh, in the right path may be right, but if you are living in the wrong place where you don't have people who are going to teach you, and uh, also that can have a puncture. I, I can repair all these things, the good news. I'm not saying that there's no wheel, <laughs> but you have a puncture and it's a flat tire. You, is, you can pump in the air. You can pump in the air. That's why this organization is called uh, Newark something, Center for Meditative... This is the third time they invite me here to pump some air. 
So that, <laughs> so that on the wheels are well balanced. Computerized, computerized balance, you know. So they have the right path, they have established themselves in the right path, but they need to associate with the wise people. They call teachers to teach. They themselves they are training to teach. And you people you are lacking this community. And I'll end my talk with this. You are lacking this community to have organization like Newark, uh, Newark Center for Meditative Culture. Because that's a center that is going to combine these wheels. What's the wheel? When that center like tomorrow, wise people are going to come there. So all people are going there is they are going to associate with the wise people. And then it's a right suitable location. You don't go and have a beer or two over there. <laughs> it's a, a perfect place <laughs> to cultivate your mind. And then having done the good things in the past, of course all people who are going there, they have done their work, their homework. And then it's a center where you can establish yourself in the right path. So can we uh, congratulate uh, all the organizers for this uh, organization that have uh, pioneered in publishing my book in the United States. And don't forget they have invited me here. I know people like uh, Craig, uh, Greg, and all of you, uh, my sister here, my brother there, all of us, let us give a big applaud by saying Sadu, Sadu, Sadu. Thank you very much for listening to me. Because if you follow this, that's sowing seeds of peace. If you follow that, you are sowing seeds of peace. When you have associated, you associate with the, with the wise people, you uh, live in a suitable place. You actually do having, you have done good things in the past, and then you establish yourself in right uh, uh, that right path. That right path is right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. If you do that, you have nobody will stop you actually. Nobody will stop you. You don't even have to become a monk, but spiritually you are going to evolve. There's nothing is gonna stop you. I didn't know Buddhism, my brothers and sisters. Nothing. But now I know a little bit because of this four wheels of success. Thank you very much for listening. I'll invite question and answer session. This is exactly 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Questions. Yes. If you can repeat the five questions about meditation. Yes, that, I thought that was are going to be for tomorrow. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Now I'm going to repeat the questions. You don't want the answers. No. You will find yourself. The first one is, what's meditation? The, th the second question is, why you meditate? Why we meditate? The third one, is how to meditate. The fourth one is when to meditate. And then the last one, who meditates? If you find that one for me, then you are fit to meditate. <laughs> because people come and meditate and say, what's meditation? Oh, emptying your mind and you have no thoughts. Good luck, you won't find your car. <laughs> Where is my car? <laughs> I can't see my car. <laughs> Where's my girlfriend? <laughs> so good. People actually, this is not a joke, you know. People come and meditate, and then I ask them what meditation is to have no thoughts. That's the answer. To have no thoughts. To become a vacuum. That's what they say. <laughs> to make this a vacuum. So, my brothers and sisters, <laughs> you come tomorrow and you'll be sorted. <laughs> You will know exactly the answer to those five questions. I'm not going to let them know. <laughs> so you went to study business? I went to study business. What impacted you to become a monk? Ah, that's another story, my brother. <laughs> to become a Buddhist is one thing, and, bec <laughs> and become a monk even is yet another. Yeah, so where should we start? <laughs> okay, Buddhism. <laughs> okay, that's a good question, actually. I told you I was born as a Roman Catholic yeah. and I studied in boarding school and my, my family is a staunch Christian family, staunch. My uncle goes to Rome and actually my uncle who brought me because my father at some stage died, he's actually one of the Pope Knights, put on black. There are 12 of, the, 12 of, the, 
12 of them in Uganda. There used to be six, but he was among the six. He goes to Rome with, and he's a purple soldier, you know. They put on those black things, you know. So our family is very Christian. I was born in, in this family, which is very uh, Christian. And I went to boarding schools mostly after primary seven. I, I attended boarding schools. And I was really brought up in a very uh, serious Christian environment. But when I went to Uganda, I mean to India, I start to see a few things. You are going even to read it here, but as I told you, this is not a biograph, but many things are not here, even if this is an expanded version. But I start observing the difference between my religion I was born in and the new one that I'm trying to embrace. The first thing was about questions. I was not allowed to ask questions when I was in Uganda. Any question I ask is, no, believe, no need to ask this question. But in this Indian place, uh, in a suitable place, I would ask this question, I would ask, I would get answers. Nobody was discouraging you to ask questions. In fact, that's why for me, I always ask people to ask questions because in Buddhism, it's okay to ask many questions. As many as you can. There's only 10 questions that are discouraged in Buddhism and we give a reason why. In Buddhism, 10 questions, they are called 10 unanswered questions. Not 10 unanswerable questions. They are 10 unanswered questions and we don't answer them for only three reasons. Otherwise, you can ask about anything in Buddhism. And that was for me amazing. And I give you homework. Why would not answer? Why wouldn't you answer those ten questions? There are three reasons. One is epistemological reason, because it's beyond the the way of knowledge. We call it epistemology. Another reason is pragmatic reasons. They are not practical. Another one is psychology. They are they are wrongly put. Wrongly put. They can ask you. You have a daughter. How many wings is your daughter? Can you answer that question? I mean, <laughs> it's out of place. We know human beings don't have wings, they don't fly, you know. So it's psychologically put wrongly. That's why we don't ask, answer those 10 questions. Is the world eternal, internal? Is it or both? Is, it, uh, is the world, uh, there are questions like that, whether the world is finite or not. What has that got to do with my meal today? <laughs> In other pro pragmatic reasons, we don't answer. So in Buddhism, I found out you can ask any question you want, except those things. Two is the degree of freedom. You don't have to be a Buddhist to follow Buddhism. You can come in today, tomorrow you say, well, I want to retire, I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> Give me a break, <laughs> I'm not a Buddhist. Nobody will get disappointed. Suddenly the Buddha will not get out of the Buddha will never get a point disappointed because you are leaving Buddhism. And no Buddhist follower will try to say, oh, please come to be a Buddhist, or please leave to be a, leave Buddhism, no. So the second reason was the degree of freedom that I experienced in Buddhism. The third reason is the uh, very systematic, very systematic teachings, the way it is packed. The Buddha taught for 45 years, I was born as a Roman Catholic, Jesus taught for three years. So now, I found that Buddha's teaching was very, very well arranged. And that could be an, an analogous to a, going to a library. And you find the books of physics, they are all arranged in the physics section, chemistry in the chemistry section, <laughs> anatomy in the <laughs> ayurvedic. I mean, it's easy to go through all this library and get what you want. But if you have the same thing, you have the same books, it's all in physics books in chemistry, <laughs> chemistry books in ayurvedic medicine, books, and all. it's very confusing. I'm not saying that they don't have books. They have books. <laughs> it's probably the same books, <laughs> but so mixed up, I can't find them quickly. For me, I found out Buddhism was very well as systematically arranged, and many other reasons, uh, but that many actually, yeah. I mean, Basically, even the final destination. For me, the final destination was not very clear before Buddhism, but when I became a Buddhist, I found out that the 
the final destination is very, very clear. Final liberation, final happiness, final peace. The rest is just really commentary. <laughs> you, the final goal for meditation is to uh, reach ultimate happiness, to achieve ultimate peace. And then for heaven and hell, you go with actually it's a two-way ticket. You have a return ticket in Buddhism. Other places you have a one-way ticket. <laughs> for me that's great. <laughs> so why not? <laughs> for me if I have a round trip ticket, I'm good to go. <laughs> good to go. Especially the hell one. <laughs> what really discouraged me? <laughs> Actually, this really t t honestly, I was so discouraged with the one-way ticket to hell. <laughs> Very discouraged. <laughs> it, it, it didn't inspire me confidence. <laughs> it didn't inspire confidence. So, my brother, that's the reason. Thank you very much for asking. Yeah. Sir, what is your definition of energy? Sorry. The definition of energy. Energy, energy. <laughs> that's quite interesting. <laughs> energy, it's a, for a call. We call it right effort. For us, it's effort to abandon. Actually, first the effort to prevent what's un, what's unskillful. Then the effort to uh, overcome what's unskillful. Then effort to develop what's skillful and then effort to maintain. So we need to first prevent, then if still something comes, you need to overcome, and you need to have the effort to develop good states of mind, and then you need effort to maintain them. That's called right effort or right energy. So for us, energy has a function of supporting associated mental states. For us, energy is something a state uh, we can say state um, or what can we say energy it's a, a mental quality let's say a mental quality that open floodgates to wholesome states of mind and stop all blocks and wholesome states of mind so now I don't want to define energy as a scientist because they have a different definition of energy. It's not destructive. It has to be transformed. I hope you're not looking for such definitions. No, <laughs> no if I'm talking about right effort in terms of right path, yeah, it's about the energy, mental energy, to prevent unskillful states of minds like greed, hatred and religion from happening. You prevent it. And also if they do happen, you overcome it by cultivating loving kindness, compassion and wisdom. And also we need energy, mental energy, to develop to develop these positive states of mind, wholesome states of mind, like generosity, like loving kindness, like compassion. But that's not enough energy. That's not enough. We have to maintain them. We have to maintain this quality. So, yeah. That's the energy. Because if you think energy, energy is like what we all are trying to utilize in the, in the participation of the life force. Yes, we can say like that, but that's more of metaphysics. You know, it's based on if you have maintenance of the life force. Right. You have health. Yes. Health is, is the aftermath of having energy, and it has to be recycled all the time. Right. Now, while we are in this recycling process, right, we have to have more intelligent, uh, intuitive systems at work. Right. In order for this energy to maintain its youth in us all. Right. Now that is what we are trying to achieve in, in my life in this case mm. because I'm at uh, 73 years young and I'm going to try to restore, keep the energy field going in myself because I'm doing things at my age that other people will not do because I understand the power of energy. Mm -hmm. 
So if I'm able to do this situation without institutionalization of my spirit, then that means I have a, a life force that is continuing. We have to eliminate the institutional enslavement that is killing our energy. Mm. That's what you did. Mm. Okay, so when you deal dealing with institutionalization of energy, we need your intelligence, your intuition, both, to make sure that we have some form of justice. Yes. That's my sister. Interesting. Very interesting. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Any other person with any question? Comment? So now, my friend Greg, you know what's meditation? <laughs> you know what's meditation? I'm working. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is the meditation? What is meditation? Yes. Um, obviously, calm in the mind, being in the present. Wow, that's great. But those are the bonus of meditation. <laughs> those are bonus. <laughs> That's a signpost that you are going in the direct, right direction. It's like when you are driving to Newark and you see <laughs> a sign. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, which sign do you have here going to Newark? What's the cross sign we have here? Jersey City. Yeah? Jersey City. Jersey City. And then <laughs> Jersey City is not Newark, but it's a sign <laughs> going to Newark. <laughs> so calmness are those signs of so meditation is mental development. The Pali word is bhavana. It's to develop your mind. So if you want to, if somebody asks you what's meditation, don't lie around. It's mental development. <laughs> yes. That's it. Why you meditate, that's also we can briefly, so because I don't know whether you're coming tomorrow. But what's meditation? You know that. Mental development. Two words. Don't even count off so these and these going around in circles and circles trying to explain meditation. Meditation is mental development. Why do you meditate? That also should be articulated just in a few words. Of course, there are many reasons, but why you meditate is to purify the mind. You meditate to do what? To purify the mind from what? Greed, hatred, delusion. Buy one, you get one free. You have those shops here? <laughs> Buy one, get one free. <laughs> So here, in this case, you get four for free. <laughs> if you really meditate, if you find a man, you overcome pain, you calm your mind. All those are bonus. Greg, calming your mind is a bonus. So you purify your mind, then you are going to be calm. You, it's like taking a shower. You shower, you grab a shower, you purify your body, and you feel calm. Those are benefits. We shouldn't make... Be, mm, mix them with the, the purpose of meditation. When to meditate, you have seen the purpose is very clear. If you want to, uh, if you want to know where, when to meditate, you have to look at what meditation and the purpose. Because if you know what meditation and its purpose, you don't meditate until you, this monk come from Uganda. <laughs> you don't wait until this monk come from Uganda because you want to purify your mind anyway, anytime, mm -hmm. don't you? Do you want some pa to be part-time? Like, okay, one time uh, my mind is impure, another time is, is it pure? No. Meditate. When to meditate? All time, except when you're fast asleep. Just remember, meditation is better than medication. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, in this book, I, I talk about this. I don't know if you read it. When people really ask me, it. yeah, most people ask me, what's meditation? I mean, what are you doing? I'm, I'm doing meditation. Oh, medication. <laughs> you, are, you, you, are, you are going to see this in this book. You read it already? Believe me, I know it. <laughs> Great. Okay. I think, Greg, the first three questions are very clear. Yeah. So, another question. I have the youngest participant here. Yes. Wow. What a blessing. Yeah. What a blessing to have the youngest participant here. Yes. She's closer than the rest of us. <laughs> you see this young participant is in a meditation mode. The way that participant is breathing, 
Nobody can breathe the way how she's breathing. Is it he or she? She. So the way she's breathing, now look the way she looks, is very present. Very present. Doesn't know what's going in the politics, <laughs> stock exchange, you what? No, no, no. It's very present. <laughs> so that mind, we all come from here. And the good news is that when we meditate, we go back to that mind. Mm. Where there's no doing, where there's no, uh, there's no having, it's just being. Yeah. And that's why we call human beings. <laughs> being, being human. Being human. That's our birthright. She's real. <laughs> we are doing, very busy doing, human doing, human having, why I go have lunch. Now we are thinking what we are going to have dinner. Look at that, that kind of gazing. That's where we want to be. That's where we want to be. You are doing the right thing, girl. Come to Uganda. <laughs> Come and we take a picture together because you know the mission. <laughs> oh, my friend. Okay, so what? How are we doing with the time? Did yeah. You want to share the video at the uh, yeah. Oh, there was a video. I even forgot about the video. Please, let's go. Let's go for it. I think. Welcome to the Uganda Buddhist Center, the first and the only Buddhist center in Uganda. We are located in Ndere. Through this initiative, we have done many projects and many programs that help our community, not only us. at our school. We have indeed been suffering by moving long distances approximately two kilometers looking for water. I take it a pleasure to thank the Uganda Buddhist Center for that water project which is being sold. I think problems connected to water are going to be solved by the water project. We are so grateful, the children are happy, even the community around the school is happy about the project being sold. So at the moment we have uh, five boreholes on the village. The now, the one which is at Bugabu Primary School is under construction. But the whole idea was moved by compassion. I want to help people who are suffering from not having access to clean water. It 
started actually with making papers. These papers were to replace polythene bag as an environmentalist. I really again see polythene bag scattered around the compound. In fact, when you look at our compound, you can hardly see a single polythene bag. A friend of mine came to me and introduced to me a women empowerment project at the Uganda Buddhist Center. Uh, I really thank God for the Uganda Buddhist Center because it has restored my home. When I come to the Uganda Buddhist Center, we clean, we eat, we play, we dance, we drum. The things I've learned at Uganda Buddhist Center are Buddhism, the five precepts, the ten precepts, Kindness. So the focus here was social values in the African context and then ethical conduct. So our education is one of moral education. Of course, we respect the ordinary national curriculum, but really we focus more on mindfulness meditation to train the mind so that we can be peaceful. We focus on social values in the African context. We want to revive our culture. That's why we focus on most of, most of the time proverbs. We want to focus on ethics, uh, ethics. So that's the, the birth of the uh, peace school. Now, uh, where it is going in the future, I'd like to, this school to start with the primary school, then it will go to the secondary school, then the Buddhist college, and then a Buddhist university. This is again going to be the first and the only Buddhist university in Africa. So that's where our peace school is going. The venerable Buddha Makita uh, has uh, a great vision. A great vision that here needs a support of everybody across the globe. Locally and internationally, this is a great idea of uh, initiating the very mind. first international <laughs> African Buddhist university in Uganda. My brothers and sisters, I would like to welcome you to the Uganda Buddhist Center so that we can, we can realize our vision in this lifetime. Thank you very much. Namo Buddha. Some of the work we're doing is part of watering the seed actually. <laughs> watering the seed so it doesn't dry. Thank you for rescuing Uganda from Sorry? the legacy. Thank you for rescuing Uganda from the legacy of terror. Yes, Idi Amin. <laughs> <laughs> Idi Amin. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. You're, you're welcome. Absolutely. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh then the next thing is, uh, did you see my mother in the video? Is she's a nun? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what's going on in the video. Yeah, actually, you 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 can go to the website. The website here, you can see that video also is on the website. Let me see the address. I hope they put right with a few people, maybe five people, but the rest of the group are afraid to be converted, and it's about Easter time. So now. <laughs> How can you forego Easter <laughs> and go to Buddhist retreat? <laughs> so now I showed up in the office at the university. I said, Father, I understand what you're saying, but can those nuns answer these two questions for me? All these Christian nuns, can, you, can they answer these two questions? I have also two questions. One is when you learn English, do you become an English woman? <laughs> yeah, because some of them, uh, you may have a PhD in, in English, that doesn't make you an English woman or English. You don't even go to from Uganda, go to England <laughs> and say, hey, here I am. This is my PhD in English. I'm an Englishman, I'm an English woman. You don't do that, especially when you're from Uganda. Maybe when you're from America. <laughs> now they said, no, of course, 
venerable, you learn English, you get a PhD in English, you are still a Ugandan. Okay, then the second question, when you learn English, do you actually forget Luganda, which is our local language? Yes, so of course no, we speak both. <laughs> I say yes, you are going to attend our meditation retreat, you are going to still be a Christian nun, you are not going to be a Buddhist. In fact, that doesn't even qualify you to be a Buddhist. <laughs> Then oh, they, they attended actually. Mm. And now, they are, since then, they always demand me, when is the next one? Where is the next one? They are the one who asked me, to, in fact, the father told me he wants to live long enough to say Buddhist University. Mm. Wow. This year, I was supposed to go to the university and teach them so that they get a certificate in meditation. Mm. So, what's going to happen in, in Uganda and in Africa is my approach to introducing Buddhism. I don't introduce a bucket of sand. I introduce a bucket of seeds, and so is planting dharma seeds. Why am I saying seeds? Because I prepare the fertile soil of Africa. What is the fertile soil of Africa? I, I actually go to the deep, deep ways how African thinks. And for me, the, it will apply the same African American, because that was part of my studies. Mm. Part of my studies is healing intergenerational trauma. My thesis, my brothers and sisters, my thesis at the University of Peredonia in Sri Lanka is healing intergenerational trauma using, in this case, African wisdom or African culture and right mindfulness. So I'm combining African culture and right mindfulness on the other hand a little bit of a dose of my Christian upbringing and put them together and I can introduce just Buddhism or mindfulness just about anywhere. Just about anywhere on the African continent and beyond. Because I know, what's, what's your thoughts? What happened most of the people who introduced Buddhism in, in Uganda or in Africa? In Uganda, they never introduced. <laughs> I'm the one who brought it to Uganda. <laughs> So those who are very early missionaries, they went to South Africa, they introduced Buddhism like sand. They drop, they bring a bucket of sand and drop it in Africa. So then you go there one year, it's still the same thing. Whether it's mindfulness-based reduction from the United States, that's it. That's the same thing, that's the same culture. Me, when I'm introducing meditation in Africa, I want to see what African thinks about generosity. What African think about compassion? What's the African thought before Christianity? What's the African thought before Buddhism? What's the African thought before Islam? Once I get that, then we start. We are together. That's why I call seeds. Yeah, planting Dharma seeds. Because I know it's learning at a fertile soil. So I can do it anyway, actually, after that research. I can, you just drop me in Wyoming <laughs> and then <laughs> I say Wyoming. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't have. Oh, you, I don't have. Montana. <laughs> you drop me there, okay, Bante. These people want to learn mindfulness, <laughs> but they're afraid to be converted to Buddhism. I know how to start. You drop me in a culture. Now I know how to do it, but it didn't come easily. It's three years of really hitting the wall. You talk as if you are coming from heaven. <laughs> so that's what. Uh, that's why this book actually was uh, advice. Uh, it is actually a direct outcome of a Christian. This book <laughs> to answer your question. That's the one. The father is called Father Everest. He's a Buddhist, but he doesn't know the Buddhist. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> Don't tell him that. <laughs> anyway, another question. We have five minutes, I think. We end at nine. Oh, we have to uh, sign the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let, let us not forget signing. <laughs>